Uh, we're going to be in First Kings again tonight, continue our study, and a little bit of Second Chronicles as well. But let's talk about last week first, which uh, we looked at Rehoboam, so the follow-up to Solomon's act, son of Solomon. Uh, Rehoboam took over. He became king when he was about 41 years old. Uh, and, of course, son of Solomon, grandson of King David. And we talked last week uh, kind of about how this guy really had so much going for him in the beginning. So many resources lined up behind him. And first, just kind of pedigree. I mean, you can't ask for a better pedigree if you're going to be the leader of God's people. Your grandfather, one of the most godly men to ever walk the planet, wrote a bunch of the Psalms, you know, that we sing and even today. And, 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 and your father, one of the, probably the second most wise person to ever live, second to Jesus. I mean, so the, those, that's your dad and your grandfather. Great setup, great setup in terms of the treasuries, uh, you know, running a budget surplus when he took office and everything. So, so really set up for success. And, and you know, what, what elected official or what king wouldn't want to come in with running a surplus? You know, that's a great place to be. Uh, expand, and, and then, you know, not to mention the, the wealth of advisors, of counselors that were around him, even some from his father's cabinet, from his father's administration, uh, and his grandfather's administration were there on hand to offer him wise counsel, which they did. When the people came to him right off the bat with a very reasonable request, you know, we helped your father build this kingdom. Uh, a lot of construction needed to be done. A lot of work needed to be done. And so we agreed to conscripted labor, essentially slavery, to help your father with his projects. We agreed to the really high taxes, uh, the burdens that he put on us. Now that you're king, let's back off a little bit. Let's, let's do things a little differently. And so the counsel of these older wise men was... Yeah, that, that's, that's good. Um, show them that you're going to be a servant of the people. Hear them. Respond well to that. Uh, he went then to another group of counselors, his buddies, uh, guys about his age who he'd kind of grown up with and stuff. And their advice was, how dare they tell you how to be king? You show them, you know... Uh, my little finger is like my dad's waist. I mean, I'm stronger, I'm tougher, and I'm going to like make it even harder. He whipped you with whips. I'm going to whip you with whip you with scorpions. You thought he was hard. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, that didn't work out well. Uh, a rebellion began with Jeroboam, uh, who was kind of a rival to his father Solomon, but then kind of brought this counsel from the people to him, uh, and Jeroboam ended up uh, becoming king there of the northern kingdom. So you had Rehoboam started with 12 tribes, ended up with two tribes. Started out governing the nation of Israel. And we are told in chapter 12, verse 1, that all of the people supported him in the beginning. But there, uh, quickly thereafter, 90% didn't support him. So that's how his reign went. Uh, and that was about listening to advice, being careful who you listen to, having good, wise counselors around you. And after Rehoboam died, he was a lousy king. After he died, his son Abijah took over uh, for about three years, another lousy king. Uh, and up north, Jeroboam is ruling over the ten northern tribes, ruling over Israel in about 20 years into his rule, this fellow Asa comes into power in the south, in the kingdom of Judah. And Asa will serve for over four decades as the ruler of Judah, as of the ruler of the southern kingdom. He was good. He was a good king. He was a good man. He was a good follower of, of God. Uh, and you know, if, if you have any... Um, knowledge of how the kings went in either the north or the south, that was a rarity, right? Having a good king who loved the Lord was, was really a precious and rare thing in Israel or in Judah. Uh, Asa was one of these rare gems. And so we're in the middle of a series in 1 Kings right now, but we're going to need some Second Chronicles tonight because Second Chronicles is really going to give us the color commentary where First Kings is only going to give us some very broad details about the reign of Asa. Now, the first thing that the historical archive tells us in First Kings is he, was, he made a devoted effort to getting rid of, 
of false gods and false religion uh, in the kingdom of Judah. Devoted effort, wiping those things out, clearing out uh, shrines and altars, even a high personal cost for him because his own mother, a woman named Maka, she was uh, wrapped up in all of this pagan worship. Uh, she worshipped a deity called Asherah. So we'll pick it up in 1 Kings 15, starting verse 9. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom, and Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David, his father, had done. It's actually his grandfather, but that's just a way of speaking in, in Hebrew. He put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land, removed all the idols that his father, fathers had made. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image for Asherah. And Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. So we get kind of a, 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 a summary there of what he did. He didn't just talk the talk. He kind of walked the walk. There were these homosexual prostitutes that were involved with some of the local uh, Baal deities and things. So he got rid of them, expelled them from the land. Uh, it, idols and images were thrown into the fire, worshipped to false gods, uh, and even his mother was removed from her position in the royal household because she was such a bad influence. Couldn't have somebody like that in a leadership role in Israel who was worshipping an Asherah. Uh, by the way, this is why we need both First Kings and Second Chronicles to get the complete story on this. Because if you just read what First Kings says you're going to have the impression that Asa really wasn't totally getting rid of, of all of the pagan worship sites. He got rid of some, but not all of them. If you read Second Chronicles, uh, the ones that he didn't remove, it's true, he didn't remove all of them, but it appears from Second Chronicles the ones he didn't remove were in the north, were actually not in his kingly jurisdiction. They were in Israel. That's what it looks like from Second Chronicles. Uh, so Second, uh, Second Chronicles 15, 17. Um, so he didn't invade the northern kingdom in order to remove those shrines uh, in high places. So generally speaking, clear picture, a good king, a godly man. Uh, but that last word is always the key qualifier in these kind of character studies from the Bible. The men and women of the Bible, they are men and women, okay? So calling them good is always it's an important reference to say they are men and women, which means they are imperfect. They are sinners like us. And so Asa was not a perfect person, but he was a good king and he loved the Lord. Uh, so let's hit what's probably the highlight of his time as leader in Jerusalem. Um, he had a national security strategy which hinged on two things. One, faith in God. I think we can agree that's a good thing. Faith in God. Number two, build a strong defense. Both of those. Faith in God, build a strong national defense. So let's see what he did. Second Chronicles 14, 7 to 8. Uh, he said, let's build up these towns and put walls around them with towers and gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Asa had an army of 300,000 men from Judah equipped with large shields and with spears and 280,000 from Benjamin armed with small shields and bows. All these were brave fighting men. So this is toward the beginning of his reign. He invests a lot in building this defensive structure, these bulwarks and towers and walled cities, key places around the kingdom. He made sure, we can tell from the text, that his army was numerous and well-equipped, well-armed, and that everyone understood 
God is the real source of our protection. God is the one who brought us here. God has got our backs. And there is a real spiritual insight when you put these two pieces together. Having faith does not mean that you sit back and do nothing, right? It doesn't mean that, typically. Um, it, it, faith for Asa wasn't, it wasn't a lack of faith for him that he had wall cities constructed. It wasn't a lack of faith for him that he raised an army. It wasn't a lack of faith that he gave them shields and weapons. That was not a lack of faith. He had faith in God to defend Israel. He also recognized he had been anointed by God as king. He was in a partnership with God. He was an instrument of God. Okay, So he had a part to play. But ultimately, his trust is on God. I hope that makes sense because that is a real key life principle for us. Like it is not an act of faith to leave your doors unlocked at night. That's an act of foolishness. It is not an act of faith to, I'm not saving for the future. I trust that God will take care of me. I'm not going to save a dollar for the future. That's not an act of faith. That's foolishness. That's not using the wisdom and the brain and the resources that God has given you. Um, it's, it, so it's foolishness. So what's the line there? You know, where's the line? Um, is it up to me or is it up to God? Well, it's a partnership. Um, you and God are walking through life together and he's given you a lot of tools to use and he expects you to use those. Really, if you want to boil this down, it gets down to the heart. Where is your heart? And unfortunately, that's not something we can put a, a dipstick in and measure um, but we get these insights from the Bible about where certain people's hearts were. And we see where Asa's heart was at this point. Uh, two people can plan and prepare and make many of the same courses of action. Uh, but that doesn't mean they have the same hearts. They have the same level of faith in God. And Judah got tested here. The southern kingdom got tested straight away. Zerah the Cushite, you probably never heard of this guy. Uh, well, he was a menace for a time. Zerah the Cushite in chapter 14 decided to come against Asa's army. I mean, the kingdom is divided. He's only got two tribes down here. The picking is ripe. So he decides to come against Asa's army with his own fart fighting men, including these chariots, which were kind of the ancient version of battle tanks. Um, so Asa and his army comes out to meet them on the field of battle. And before the battle, we get to see a little bit about Asa's heart. So here we go. 2 Chronicles 14, 11. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you. There is no one like you. To help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So we see the heart of a godly leader here. Essentially, Asa had used all of the brains, all of the energy, all of the resources that God provided him to get ready for battle. And then, on the day of battle, he called on all of the people to trust that the victory was coming from God. They were going to rely on God. So, God was honored both in the preparation and in the proclamation. He was honored in the way Asa marshaled what God had allowed him to put together to defend the nation. And he was certainly honored on the day of the battle by the proclamation of faith that King Asa made. After the victory, a guy named Azariah comes with a prophetic word, a spirit anointed word from God to the king, to Asa, and it's a word that I think still speaks to us today. This is in 2 Chronicles 15, 2. He said, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. 
And I know that was spoken to this specific individual on this specific day. But I think it speaks to us right here, right now. Seek God and he will be found. In fact, Jesus pretty much said that knock and the door will be open to you, right? Forsake him and he will forsake you. Shut the door and God's like, okay, I can tell I'm not welcome here. Um, so as disciples of Jesus, bringing that kind of into our walk with the Lord, we live in connection with him. He is master, we are servants. He is the rabbi, we are the disciples. He is the vine and we are the branches, okay? He said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Same idea. God is inviting us to stay close, to stay connected because he is our Savior. He's saying, stay close to me. Put your faith in me, not in yourselves, in your talents, in your treasures. So Azariah then concludes this message to the king. He says in verse 7, But you take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. That's quite a promise. And that may be the word that you need to hear today. From God to you, that your work will be rewarded. If you're fighting to do what's right, if you're working to do what's right, if you're working to build a strong marriage, your work will be rewarded. If you're working, if you're making sacrifices to conduct yourself with character in the workplace, your work, work will be rewarded. If you're working hard in ministry, it may not be noticed. It may not get a lot of attention. Your work will be rewarded. So take courage. And I like that phrase, by the way, take courage. Because take courage infers that courage isn't something we're just born with. Um, we're kind of born fraidy cats. You know, that's why we come out of the womb crying, I think. You know, I mean, courage is something you have to grab a hold of. It's something you have to claim. It's not something that we naturally have. So we take a hold of of courage. We grab onto that so that we can have a reserve supply of that. Other leaders around Asa, other leaders before Asa, even from his own family, had just decided to kind of go with the flow. You know, here's the current. It's going to be easier if I just kind of swim downstream with everybody else with popular culture rather than trying to swim, swim upstream. Um, just kind of We'll just kind of go with that. Uh, but the word for Asa was clear. Asa, God wants you to be different. He wants you to take courage. Uh, he wants you to work to be this unique leader. Um, and so, be a leader who refuses to quit, uh, who trusts in God, and your sacrifice will be rewarded. And I think that's an important message. So Asa, we've already seen, he cleared out centers of false worship around Judah. Um, he sidelined his mom. That couldn't have been an easy conversation. Uh, he did not, however, uh, just delete the bad stuff, right? He didn't just take the bad stuff up. He, he tried to bring in God to the center of life in Israel. Um, so he repairs the altar of the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Apparently it had fallen into disrepair. Don't know how bad a shape it was in, but he gets it all fixed back up. They begin sacrificing as a nation to Yahweh. Uh, and they, at his invitation, they, the people, commit themselves to follow God. And it's a really powerful moment in the nation's history here. This is in chapter 15 of Second Chronicles verses 14 and 15, they, this is the people of Judah, they swore an oath to the Lord with a loud voice. Imagine the volume here. <laughs> with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with horns. And all Judah rejoiced over the oath for they had sworn with all their hearts and had sought him with all their desire and he was found by them. And the Lord gave them rest uh, all around. 
So that's kind of, that's your high point of the administration. I'm sure every president's term in office or every king's reign is marked by some high point. You kind of want to work toward that, right? Well, this is his high point. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the low point, which comes a little later on. Up north, northern kingdom, a man named Basha is ruling up there, uh, his counterpart in Israel, the northern kingdom, and a storm is brewing. Basha wants to unite all of Israel. He wants to take that throne away from Asa, and so he has enlisted the help of a regional power over in Syria or Aram, which at this point is led by a fellow named Ben-Hadad. And he crafts a treaty with Ben-Hadad, who is headquartered in Damascus. So we're going to go to battle together. You're going to help me fight this battle against the southern kingdom. Asa hears about this, and his first response, his primary move is to clear out the palace of valuables, to clear out the temple. I want you to think about this. To clear out the temple of valuables, the gold, the silver, load it all up in carts. We're going to drive it with a delegation up to Damascus. We're going to dump it in front of Ben-Hadad of Aram and plead with him to switch sides. Help us. Instead of helping Israel, instead of helping Basha, did the strategy work? Yes and no. It did convince Ben-Hadad to switch sides. He was easily bought. So it did get relief for Judah. Basha, or Basha did pull his forces back from this imminent attack on the southern kingdom. Um, but it failed in the respect... Uh, that it wasn't a good spiritual move. It failed because it sidelined Asa's real ally, God. So, strategic move, nice. Spiritual move, not nice. Okay. Um, so he began fortifying against attack from the north, and the attack never did materialize now that Ben-Hadad had joined forces with Judah. But I can't help, when I read this, I can't help but kind of be struck by the symbolism. Like, think about this in terms of prayer and supplication. It, uh, the southern kingdom, they've, been, they've, they've, announced their, they've, they've announced their faith in God, and you're the one, they're praying to God, and they're shouting to God. But now they're offering sort of a prayer of a sword, and it's kind of symbolic that they load up all the treasures of the temple, and they roll them... These, these things that are dedicated to Yahweh. No, they load them in a cart and they take them all to Ben-Hadad. It's almost like they're praying to a new Lord. They're putting their reliance in someone other than Israel's God. Doesn't it feel that way? And so, it's a bit of a problem. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 16, 7-10. Another voice from the Lord comes into Asa's life. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram, or Syria, and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans, these are the ones he fought earlier, were not, were not they a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. So there's a history lesson in there, talking about the Cushites and the Libyans. I mean, this, this seer, this prophet, reminds him of these battles that he won with God's help. Remember? I mean, did you forget how when you relied on God and you went to battle against this great army and this great army, how you experienced victory? 
and now you've given that up and you're trusting in someone other than God, well, you're just going to keep fighting wars now. There's just going to be violence to come because you didn't have faith. Why did your heart shift from trusting in God and essentially offering prayers of supplication to the king of Syria? What happened? What did Asa do when he saw the king of Israel moving south with his forces? He ran to Syria with a pile of gold and begged for help. His first thought was to run to a foreign king. The eyes, we're told in this prophetic word, the eyes of the Lord are searching the whole earth for hearts that he may strengthen, hearts that are fully committed to him. And that verse, I think, is even more powerful now that you see the context of that verse. God is looking for people who remember how faithful he's been. He's looking for a people who won't forget when times get tough that he has stood with them until this point in their journey. I think that's why we do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said, every Sunday. We put that front and center. We remember how faithful God has given. He, he gave us life. You're here because God allowed you to come into the world. He sent his son to redeem you. He gave his son on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins so you could have eternal life. He's powered you with the Holy Spirit. He has been faithful. Remember that. May God be your first responder when you're in a moment of crisis and not a last resort. He wants our hearts to be fully committed to him. He doesn't want to be a backstop. He doesn't want to be an in-case-of-emergency break glass. He doesn't want to be... A plan B, he wants to be he wants to be God, because that's who he is. So we take courage and we choose to rely on God. We choose to put our faith in God and we ask God, give us more courage. May we be fully committed to you. Not thirty percent, not forty percent, a hundred percent committed to you. And yes, like Asa. Sometimes our hearts aren't exactly where they need to be. And that's when we can pray what Asa's own grandfather once prayed. King David in Psalm 139, David prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And I love that acknowledgement there. There might be a grievous way. There might be a place where I've drifted away from you. And then there's that petition that David makes. Pull me back. Bring me back into that everlasting way, into the middle of your will. Let's pray, and then we'll sing together. God, you've been nothing but faithful all the way through. And as we can see from every example of men and women who walked with you, that, that doesn't guarantee that we will have a problem-free life. Certainly doesn't guarantee that we're never going to have challenges, that we're never going to face enemies like Asa faced throughout his reign. But it does mean that we can count on you. You have proven yourself in our battles. And I pray, God, that we will be fully committed to you. That we will be fully committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. You are the vine. We are the branches. And if we are not connected to you, we can achieve nothing. And so we acknowledge that. And we pray for your help. We pray, God, if there be any grievous way any shortcoming in our hearts tonight, that you'll repair that, that you'll call us back into the middle of your way, in the middle of your path. We ask this with faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.